Today we are going to explore an unusual item from the Aramount Library that has pushed me as a reader. This is a book without words, a book without binding, and a book without a cover. Today our hidden gem is a mystery in a portfolio box. Man Ray's Revolving Doors. Hello, I'm Emily Moore, librarian in residence. We are so excited to welcome you to another episode of From the Vaults from Rare Book and Special Collections here at the Library of Congress. Born Emanuel Radnitsky in 1890, the artist who would become Man Ray spent his childhood in Philadelphia and Brooklyn, cities bursting with movement and color, a stage for urban performances that would later appear regularly in his work. The son of a tailor, Ray grew up surrounded by the patterns, clothing swatches, and cut string of his father's trade. And from an early age, Ray challenged society's tendencies to define practice and put identities in a box. More concerned with concept and theory than he was with a specific medium, Ray was a jack of all trades, working as a photographer, painter, sculptor, filmmaker, poet, and printer. He shifted between movements and worlds, flirting with Dada, surrealism, and abstraction. His portraits of the fashion world and social elite appeared in the glossy pages of Harper's Bazaar and Vogue, while he continued to experiment with form and push the boundaries of photography, film, and image. In 1921, he crossed the Atlantic to join the Parisian Dada, a move that deepened the ambiguous nature of his practice and identity. Accounts of his life, including his own, are largely apocryphal, as his primary goal was for his art to speak for itself. And something that speaks very loudly is this 1926 set of 10 pouchoir or stencil prints, the Technicolor Revolving Doors. Originally made as, as a set of paper collages in 1915 and 1916, these images enjoyed a long life as prints, debuting in New York in 1926 and appearing in a 1935 edition of the surrealist magazine Minotaur. One of the essential things to know about this set is that it originally hung. Suspended, the prints evoked their title, revolving and responding to the breeze of the gallery in which they were shown. Viewers were encouraged to move the prints themselves, a gesture of co-authorship that revealed Man Ray's interest in the so-called fourth dimension of movement. Ray's use of line and color enhanced this play. Using the sharp transition of color to indicate movement, Ray added lines and squiggles, overlapping shapes that responded and reached to each other. Here, for example, we have an orchestra, a full body of instruments compressed into a single object, their unification akin to the sound they create. This play is part of what makes Ray's work so dynamic and exuberant. Through color and line, he uncovers the core elements of an object or experience. Man Ray's resistance to being defined by a singular identity, practice, or movement points, perhaps, to the variety of his influences, which at this time included American modernism, cubism, and Dada. The original Revolving Doors collages were made a few years after the famous 1913 New York Armory show, in which Ray saw works by Henri Matisse and Marcel Duchamp, both of whom he would later meet and photograph. Ray himself spoke of the Armory show as a turning point, noting that he, quote, did nothing for six months. It took him that long to digest what he had seen. Collage itself was originally a cubist technique, one we see employed by other artists in the Aramount collection, including Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque. We know that in 1911 and 1915, Ray saw work by Picasso at Albert Stieglitz's 291 Gallery. Revolving Doors bears the signatures of cubism, with its flattening of the picture frame, its emphasis on shape, and the abstraction and reduction of form to their most essential elements. In 1915, years before he moved to Paris, Ray first met Duchamp, when the two artists played a game of tennis without a net or a court, a true Dada start to their relationship. Revolving Doors reveals a similar sensibility, a rejection of the logic of mimetic representation in exchange for the absurdity and freedom of visual play and abstraction. These prints push against definition. Suspended, their movement suggests dimension. Are they, in fact, sculpture? Ray's 1916 essay, A Primer of the New Art of Two Dimensions, offers insight into his theoretical approach here, in which he identifies the flat plane as the basis for all art, from visual work to music, and the unifying feature that dismisses the need for the separation of disciplines and media. And with that, we bid farewell to Man Ray and his dancing sculpture of prints. The Treasures of the Aramount present such a wonderful opportunity for us to grow as readers and art lovers, and I hope you join us again soon for another episode of From the Vaults from the Rare Book and Special Collections Division at the Library of Congress.